Here on two, Out of the Trees with Graham Chapman. Than the universe, a multitude of mighty galaxies. Within each galaxy, a myriad of mighty star systems. Within each star system, a multiplicity of mighty planets. And in just one of these mighty planets, the mighty British Rail Electric Train. <laughs> Panther. We always use it. Oh, Colcast Panther. That rings a bell. We you use, use that for cutting the grass? Mm. Yes, you push it. And all the little blades go round and sort of cut the grass. Oh, ours is motorised. What? Oh, our other one's motorised. Your other one? <laughs> I didn't know about that. Oh, we don't like to use it in front of the neighbours. Just because of the people next door, we don't use our two rotary ones. They haven't even got a lawnmower. Oh, I know how you feel. We've got half a dozen mowers that hover on air, just rotting in the garage. Because next door, they haven't even got a lawn. <laughs> and they're such sweet people, one doesn't like to humiliate them. How do you think we feel? There we are with 43 hover mowers, all with black leather buttons. <laughs> and eight-track stereo. And the people next door haven't even got a house. <laughs> It's so embarrassing. <laughs> you don't need to tell us. I mean, we're stuck with our fleet of atomic-powered Silco Glide lawnmowers. <laughs> Each with a, a sauna bath, cocktail lounge, a three adjoining cinemas and a discotheque, and the whole of India starving. <laughs> my dear, I just don't know where to put my face. Coffee. Oh, yes, yes, I would, actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Than is a word which is very rarely used to start sentences. Um, is that important? No, I was just trying to make a point. Well, there's no doubt you're right. I mean, one could certainly never start a television series with it. <laughs> ah, but we, we just have. What? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> you uh, know a lot about television, do you? Uh, yes, um... <laughs> I uh, often work for television. I've just done a voiceover for a documentary called British Rail and its place in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> television, that's interesting. Yes, well, it um, has its moments. No, 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 no. I meant the word television. It's a hybrid, you see. Is it? Yes, you see, tele comes from the Greek and vision from the Latin. It should have been either telerama or procul vision. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can see why they did it. A bastard. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean you were a bastard, I meant the word. Oh, bastard, sorry, I thought you called me a buzzard. A buzzard? Yes, it's a particularly useless kind of hawk. Oh, really? I can see I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> that particularly, too. The value of an ordinary cycle is in the exercise it gives you. Coffee? Motorcycles are little use that way. They give you no exercise, unless they break down and you have to run them home. It seems delightful to rush around on these fuzzy buzzers, filling people's eyes and hair with horrible dust, beheading chickens and kittens as you go and stealing <laughs> other things into fits. But it doesn't pay in the long run, even for oneself. If you want to keep in health, stick to an ordinary bike. Coffee. Talking of kittens, <laughs> I was once cycling along and suddenly found myself flat on the ground. I picked myself up and said to a man on the path, how did I get here, please, for I don't know? I saw a kitten run into your wheel, he replied. So, beware of kittens. Coffee? No. <laughs> but talking of coffee, <laughs> I well remember when we, that is, me and my bicycle, were taking a troop of boys on a cycling tour of the Lake District. I'd like some uh, coffee, please. Huh? Coffee. I haven't got any coffee. <laughs> well, you were shouting coffee, and you've got that coffee pot there. Oh! Coffee! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'd, uh, I'd like a sandwich, too, please. I thought you wanted coffee. Yes, I'd like a sandwich, too. I wish you'd make up your mind. <laughs> what sort of sandwiches have you got? Well, there's uh, cheese and tomato, 
Yes, and what else? What do you mean, else? Well, I mean, other than cheese and tomato sandwiches. I thought you wanted a sandwich. Yes, I did, but it sounded as though you had other sorts as well. Look, mate, cheese and tomato sandwich, take it or leave it. Right, I'll have that, if you're sure you've got nothing else. Well, there's coffee. Oh, no, thanks. I think I'll just have the uh, cheese and tomato sandwich. You'll just have the cheese and tomato sandwich? Yes, please. No, I mean, and the coffee as well. <laughs> um, excuse me. Perhaps I can help. I think what is required is one coffee and one cheese and tomato sandwich. I haven't got any coffee. <laughs> Oh, yeah, coffee. <laughs> uh, no, I meant for him. I don't want anything. Oh, change your mind, have you? Uh, no. I know your game, mate. You're trying to mess me about very funny. Ha, oh, bloody ha. Look, it's quite simple. I want one coffee and one sandwich. He doesn't want anything. He's only trying to help. Only trying to help, eh? Look, will you please listen? It's very, very simple. I have been listening, mate. You go and get your own coffee and sandwiches. I've got a job to do, you load of tits. Well, well, I agree. <laughs> Shut up! Shut up, you load of tits. I know what you mean, mate. I used to do this job on the Liverpool line. Oh, what, the Liverpool line? That's worse than this. Yeah, I know. Look, uh, could I have one sandwich and three coffees for myself? <laughs> yeah. Oh! Yeah. Uh, what you, what you doing now, then? Oh, bloody ticket office. Oh, bloody hell. Poor bastard, that's worse than this. Yeah. Yeah, have a shot on me. Oh, thanks. See you around, mate. <clears throat> uh, um, you fancy a drop of brandy in it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, very simple. Um, do you uh, work on the railways, then? Well, not as such. I more sort of don't. <laughs> I see. Cheers. Cheers. You, uh, you work in television, then? Yes, but only voiceovers, really. What sort of thing? Documentaries and so on? Well, not always. I sometimes do adventure stuff. I mean, you know, the kind of thing like, um... Well, like, um... Europe and Asia, fragmented and torn asunder by the great duel between Pope and Emperor, was ripe to fall to a new axe. Now, out of the wastes of Central Asia, a new and formidable power emerged as the Mongols launched an attack upon the world under their mighty leader, Genghis Khan. That sort of thing. Oh, no, carry on. It was very exciting. Oh, well, uh, all right. Genghis Khan, the elected leader of the Asian warlords, was marked out amongst men because of his curious grey-green eyes. His broad forehead, his compelling beard, and the fact that he could beat the daylights out of any of them. Quit <laughs> that coming! Oh, oh, Khan. Does she know what I want of her? Oh, I'll do anything for you, O Khan, but spare my family. Then begin. Hey, not that. Oh, I said ah! stop there. Now ask him, ask him what sort of day he's at. Oh, I don't... No, just say, what sort of day are you at? What sort of day have you had? Dear. What sort of day have you had? Dear. Oh, not too bad, really. Violent, same as usual. <laughs> I said stop that. I asked him how his work's been going. Hey! Oh! <laughs> How's your work going, dear? Hey, put some affection in it. How's your work going, dear? Oh, not too bad, really. We uh, swept through Manchuria a bit, uh, spilt quite a lot of blood there. That was this morning. Uh, then this afternoon was mainly pillaging, really, and then... Uh, after that, we spilled a bit of blood around about <laughs> half four. Uh, what sort of day have you had? <laughs> Tell him. Oh, well, the father was killed. Oh, yes, dear. Cat was burned. 
Oh, really? It's about all really, and I was tortured a bit! Oh, oh I'm sorry, dear. I was, uh, I was reading this. <clears throat> right, nag him. What? Nag him. Tell him he shouldn't be reading him while you're talking to him. He'll kill me! Look, he'll bleed and kill you if you don't. <laughs> just say, just say, look, Genghis, put that thing away whilst I'm talking to you. Look, Genghis, put that thing away while I'm talking to look, you. if you don't get angry, <laughs> something might get broken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, dear. How's Towser? The dog girl, get the dog, any dog. Look, stop all this! Rape me! Rape me! No, you're just like all the others. You'd only laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> well, that was very exciting. Shh! And still the battles raged as the mighty Khan wrenched Eastern Mongolia from the Tatar, wrested Western Mongolia from the Namons, tore Central Mongolia from the Kerites, pruned Chihile from the Nuchis, and in February, pissed off with the whole of Afghanistan. <laughs> Which, uh, which battle was that? The Battle of Samarkand, Okan. Oh, dear, I really can't tell the difference anymore. Uh, <laughs> did we win? Oh, yes, Okan. It was a mighty victory. Oh, dear, after 20 years of these half-hour battles, I really get the feeling there would be something more important tonight. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you think I'm putting it on a bit? No, no. Now, Okan, we must push forward to Persia, and then we shall be poised to take over the whole world. You know, I think I am a bit. Look, you feel that. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's quite all right. Oh, right. Look, we're on the point of conquering the world tomorrow. When? Tomorrow. Ah, now, look, uh, tomorrow is a bit difficult, you see, because I was going to give a lecture on carnage techniques in Bukhara next week, and I thought I'd use tomorrow to prepare it. Well, can't you put that off? Well, not really, you see. They've paid me quite a lot for it, so I am a bit committed. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday. Well, uh, I haven't got anything down, but I'm sure I'm meant to be doing something, so we better count that out. Thursday. No, no, Thursday I am certain about. We've got my son Ogdai and his wife coming round for dinner, and I'd sort of promised the wife. But I am Ogdai. Oh, there you are, then. You wouldn't be able to make it either. <laughs> Look, will you be ready to conquer the world on Friday? Ah, well, you see, the secretary comes round on Friday mornings, all those letters to write, and then uh, lunch times out because I've got to talk about some silk deal, then I think I'm free about four. But I was hoping to get away early for a long weekend, so now, <laughs> let's see, Monday, Monday, no, R&R, &R, I'm afraid. What? R&R, &R, rest and recuperation, that's one thing I do insist upon. <laughs> now, how about Tuesday? Tuesday, yes, get look, out! uh, I'm free in the morning. No, hold on a moment, no, hold on a moment. I'd sort of made a date for meeting this awfully interesting person who knows absolutely everything about understanding things, which is a thing I'm very bad at, so that's a pity, really, because that was my only free day next week. Now, next, next Tuesday... The amount of time one actually about? spends on oh, carnage is eventually you know? completely disproportionate to the amount of satisfaction one gains from it. Apart from anything else, it's so cold and bloody uncomfortable wearing these stupid costumes. And you spend days sitting around getting bored out of your skull, waiting for some miserable battle which only takes five minutes. And you wonder, is it all worth it? I really ought to be doing more reading. How much are we getting for this battle? About the same as we got at Bakara. I don't know why we bother. <clears throat> I can make more than this out of one morning silk trading, have the rest of the week off. Oh, oh dear, and one's life isn't really one's own. <laughs> so that's more or less the whole of March out. April. Well, no, April's out. I'm going to Africa in April. That's one thing I had promised myself. May. 
Well, I don't like to commit myself that far in advance. One feels so tied down if one is completely committed beforehand. Uh, anyway, May, May, possible conquest of the world. Now, I've only penciled that in, so don't regard it as absolutely definite. Uh, but keep on with me about it, and we'll see how it goes. Look, shall I just get on with it with the other generals? Uh, well, you see, I don't know about that. Talking of I don't know, how one does ramble on. There is a house in the Sand Hills near Bournemouth with a funny name. When the occupants went into it, the wife said, What shall we call it, dear? Oh, I don't know, said the husband in a bored voice. So, the house has I don't know on the gate. What's the moral of that? Beware of bored husbands who say I don't know. But every bored husband was once a bored boy who I expect found it too much fag to clean his bicycle himself. <laughs> no, not too busy, but too lazy. Oh, I got you there, old chap. You may well blush. Uh, look, you strange person. If you're not careful, you'll wake them up. Oh, I'm careful, old chap. You have to be careful when you're stripping down a bike. Look at the way I've laid my nuts out in a neat line. <laughs> so I know where I can find them. Beware of nuts that are not in a line. Anyway, enough of this. There's work to do. The boy Jesus wouldn't have sat around talking all day. Oh, you little bitch! Oh, hello, ladies. Excuse me butting in. My name's E.W. Clifford Aldis, but you can call me W because I only use my second name. Forgive my asking, but may I inquire whether there has been some kind of altercation between you? Yes, there has. She, the little bitch, started bragging about all the lawnmowers, which I know she hasn't got. And I merely happened to mention that my husband earns more than hers, and she pulled a knife on me. <laughs> you need never be ashamed of living in a smaller house than other boys. A bigger house adds nothing to people's happiness, although I expect you think it would, and is nothing to boast of. It is the worst kind of snobbishness to boast of your father's money or the expensive things that he has. My husband... A husband, sorry. ...is the richest man in his office. Prove it. What? Come on, prove it. All right, I will. And so... <laughs> right. Now, before we read the minutes of the last meeting, I'd just like to ask, how much money have we made recently? Uh, uh, what do you mean? Today or just since the meeting began? Well, um, since I last spoke... Uh, well, let me see. That's him. <laughs> well, uh, from your last word, that's 498 million pounds. Uh, that's not including the interest at a rate of 18 and a half percent accrued during the five seconds it's taken since I started pressing the buttons. And by the time I finish this sentence, that'll be uh, 26 million pounds. Or 29 million pounds if I carry on the sentence to say the bit I'm saying at the moment. <laughs> Which I have. All 30. Right. So, gentlemen, being the majority shareholders, we sell out completely. Sell. So, which will send all the shares plummeting. Then we buy back a hundred times as many. Buy. At the cheaper price. <laughs> How much have I made so far? Ooh, um, billions. Right. Good day's business. <laughs> Gentlemen, the chairman. Sorry, I'm late. Can't stop you long. I've got a chat show to do. Uh, how are things on the money front? Oh, splendid. Piles of the stuff. Enormous quantities. Terrific amounts of cash. Unbelievable sums of money. Pantechnicans full of crisp fibre. Right, well, I'll take three quarters of it. Oh, dear, business worries. Oh, I don't know why I bother. I really ought to find more time for reading. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. You've got to admire him. He's got the violence of business down to a fine art. Oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> oh! The mighty Mongol leader, Genghis Khan, and his hordes of fearsome financial advisors swept through the stock exchanges of Europe, clinching mighty business deals and wreaking havoc of the pound. Yes, the man who was elected chairman of Asian Warlords International was marked out amongst nobles because of his curious grey-green money, his broad business acumen, his compelling fiscal ability. 
and also the fact that he could buy the daylights out of any of them. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister and Chief Fire Officer, but the latest figures, compared with those figures predicted for this period, are different by a third set of figures which were predicted previously as being predictable by draconian figures. <laughs> Need I say more? No. Yes. Say draconian again. I shall. Draconian. Oh. Give us some Mr. Prime Minister and Chief Fire Officer, I'd like to take this opportunity of denying in the most categorical terms that I never in the whole of my life ever had any form of relationship, and particularly not in a sexual way, and certainly not in a perverted way, with any member of Her Majesty's Armed Forces, and particularly not one in the 59th Battalion of Guards. <laughs> and anyway, how could I have done last week as I had a slight chill, and would have person of my standing have done so in Hyde Park in full view of the general public and the bit about the Alsatian was completely untrue <laughs> and I was certainly not wearing pantyhose. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I think I'd like to have those last remarks struck from the record. <laughs> Bring back cutting up people into little bits and putting them through black people's letterbox. Oh. Yeah. 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 Mind on all member and divisional files, so that all marks made in cabinet must be addressed through the chair. Yeah, but, but, but this is rather important. Out of order, out of order. Yeah, but look, there, there's a fire going on. There are probably people getting burnt. Out, out, of, order. Order. out, out of, order. of order, out of order. You must learn to address all your remarks through the chair. Yes, all right, uh, Prime Minister and Chief Officer, there's a fire! Make him say draconian. What? Make him say draconian! You've got to learn, you know, if you want to be in cabinet. All right, there, there's a, a draconian fire. And gerrymandering. There's a draconian fire with lots of gerrymandering. Prime Minister, Chief Officer, draconian gerrymandering. I should like to point out there was no detectable quip in that last remark. Quite right, men of Agon Fish and Firemaster. Make your quip, MP and Divisional Fire Officer. All right, there's a draconian fire. Address the chair! Get it right. Prime Minister and Chief Officer, much as I admire draconian gerrymandering... Quip! Uh, she, she was only the Parliamentary Undersecretary for State's daughter, but she goes like a rocket. Rubbish! Oh, oh, well, he likes it. Oh, well, carry on. There's a fire! And I suggest that as members of the government and firemen, it is our duty to do something about it. Prime Minister and Chief Officer, may I say gerrymanderingly and with draconian emphasis that uh, my mother-in-law has a face like a million dollars. A large S with two lines down the middle. Ho, 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 just like that. <laughs> and furthermore, that there was no detectable literary allusion in any of the previous speeches, and that puts me in mind of the late G.J. White Melville, who wrote in his book, Drink, Puppy, Drink, Drink, Puppy, Drink, and Let Every Puppy Drink. <laughs> oh, well, that was jolly good. And, uh... I now declare this meeting closed. Oh, oh, oh. Um, drop of sherry, anyone? Oh, oh, yes. oh, what about the fire? Oh, for Christ's oh, sake, there, there, there's a fire going on! And so the fire engines didn't arrive and the building was burnt to the ground. I beg your pardon? I'm sorry? Why did you just say that about fire engines? Oh, habit, I suppose. I used to be a link man. Oh, mm. but you're not anymore. No, no, couldn't stand it. Cooped up in a little box of a studio, linking one boring item to another, you know, the sort of thing. And now we have blah, 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 blah. Now, I wanted to get out and see a bit of the world. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be a link. Yes, that's why I stopped doing voiceovers. Oh, I can understand that, yes. I just wanted to do links for years and years, just so that I'd earn enough money to go out and find the link that I really wanted to do. Well, me too. I mean, I've really been looking for the ultimate in voiceovers. Delighted to meet you. My name's Michael Edwards. Mine's Kemp. I expect that fire was started by one of my husband's two secretaries. Oh. My husband's eight secretaries are always burning his offices down. The place is a constant inferno. My husband's 12 secretaries. You said he had two? Ah, yes, well, uh, two are just for burning things down. Uh, but the other ten are so obsessed with setting fire to things, he doesn't even allow them to come into the office. What do they do then? What? Oh, uh, I think uh, he might go to bed with some of them. My husband goes to bed with all his secretaries. What, just the eight? 
No, he has a team of 23 different secretaries who are going to bed with every night. <laughs> what, just at night? Oh, my husband has his 12 secretaries even before he's put spoon to grapefruit. <laughs> and during the day, he has 52 other people's secretaries. And I've never even seen him at night. He's unfaithful, then. What? <laughs> Isn't yours, then? Unfaithful? Well, is he? <laughs> my husband's so unfaithful, I haven't even seen him for five years. Oh, I haven't seen mine since the day we were married. Mine didn't come to the wedding. I've never even been to bed with my husband. I've never even seen mine. My husband doesn't even exist. Oh, never mind, dear. You've got me. <laughs> oh, Trish, you're such a comfort. Gosh, darling, what a fire. Yes. It must be hot in there. Mm. I think they're about to do their own link into something. Shall we see how they do it? Almost as hot as that hot day in August when we... Uh... Oh, yes. yes. Oh, I think that was a bit contrived. <laughs> Darling, that was wonderful. What do you mean? We didn't do anything. <laughs> Silly. Oh, yes, the walk. Oh, darling, no, don't be so rough. They're so pretty. What are? The peonies. Look. Oh. Isn't it pretty? What's this, then? A peony. Oh, you admit that, then? Admit? <laughs> but look, officer, don't try to flatter me. You won't get out of it that way. Get out of what? Calm down! But what am I supposed to have done? Not you. Uh. Huh? You've taken away the personal property of another, viz. one peony. But it's only a flower. Well, that, my lad, is theft, a felony punishable by up to 30 years imprisonment. <laughs> what do you mean, theft, felony? She just picked a flower. Stole a flower? Well, all right, we'll, we'll give it back, then. You can't, lad. It's <laughs> Well, did you intend to put it back? Um, yes, all right, we did. All right. And just how would you do that, sir? Ah, well, um, I thought I'd, um... Mm. Sellotape? Nail it back? A few well-placed rivets? Rivets? You couldn't, could you? Well, no, I suppose we couldn't. Well, there you are, then. Mind you, if you take the old bush, we couldn't prove you didn't intend to put it back. Could we? But this is ridiculous. Look, I'll buy them a whole new bush. Oh, don't try and be clever with us. Uh, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Better to do. Oh, we've got a difficult one here. Sergeant! Look, mate, will you like to come up to the station with us and be interviewed? Can be very nasty being interviewed. Are you threatening violence? Right! Send for reinforcements. <laughs> There's been a peony severance in Southwood Lane. Can we have reinforcements? Peony severance, mobilise all units. Peony severance, mobilise all units. and proceeding in an easterly direction along North End Avenue towards the scene of a severance on the west side of South End Lane. I'm reclining in my seat at an angle of uh, 65 degrees and the siren is going ah, 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 at a level approximately 15 decibels above the pain threshold. Sorry. 
Hold on, the world seems to be ending. We are too late, we are too late. They have severed the peony. They have severed the peony. <laughs> Mission has failed, mission has failed. Impossible to effect peony severance prevention. Maiden speech, I thought that. Yes. I notice you carefully avoided mentioning the issue of the presence of British troops in Mongolia. <laughs> I don't remember that. Oh, yes, you're right. It was a hydrangea. Sorry, darling. My husband's hydrangea. Oh, shut up. <laughs> and so, back to us. By the way, you never told me what you were doing on the roof of the train before you climbed in through the window. Oh, yes, I arrived there from the bridge. But why was that? Well, there didn't seem to be a station where I wanted to get on. <laughs> oh. Anyway, this is uh, where I must get off. But there isn't a stop for another 20 minutes. I say, do you mind if I join you? Not at all. After you. I say, they just dumped off the train. Yes. Do you know, that reminds me of that documentary we once saw on trains. Oh, yes. <laughs> and so, outside each mighty British rail train, a multiplicity of mighty planets. Outside each multiplicity of mighty planets, a myriad of mighty star systems. Outside each star system, a multitude of mighty galaxies. And outside each galaxy, the rest of the mighty universe. That. Mariah Aitken is now appearing in a little night music at the Adelphi Theatre, London.